Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 25 series, Can We Save the Oakland A's? And the answer to that question as we sit here on June 21st, 2027 is perhaps not. We are last place in the American League West with a 22-31 record. We are already 11 games behind the Seattle Mariners in the division. Our offense, largely as expected, has been pretty bad. And our pitching staff, somewhat more unexpectedly, has been below average. Not a total disaster, but certainly not a strength by any stretch of the imagination. And that's added up to that 22 and 31 record. Not necessarily giving up quite yet. We're not even a third of the way through this 2020-27 season. Sean Gratton and Bald Sherlock, a couple of frequent commenters, have both kind of suggested that we tank slash trade everyone away. And I've been, I think, over the three plus years that we've been running this team trying to trade away players uh, the one exception i think to that is mason miller who we have signed to a medium to long-term contract and decided to potentially try to build around but i am still regularly exploring um, what we can possibly get for the players that we have the issue, quite honestly, to some extent, is that people really aren't willing to give us anything for the players that we have. Anthony Santander, by far our best offensive player this year, and quite honestly over the two and a half years he's been with us, making a reasonable $9 million for a guy who's averaged over 30 homers and over 100 ribbies in his first two seasons in Oakland and is on pace to uh, approach those numbers again this year. When we try to shop Mr. Santander around, There's just not that much that it's, it's, it's exciting that we're going to get in return. You know, we can see we can get a bunch of players in their late 20s and early 30s. I mean, a 25-year-old Sem Reverse is the youngest player that we're offered for him. He's got below average stuff. He's listed as a starter, but at best he's a fifth starter. So just not that interesting. And we look up a prospect package for Mr. Santander. Actually, we can't show you that right now since I've already done that offline for him and other players. Um, and there's just not a lot out there that's really going to be valuable to us. So I get the point, and I would like to potentially extract whatever value we can we don't have too many guys over 30 in our everyday lineup at this point but we do have a fair number of pitchers that are in their 30s so I've added most of those guys to the trade block I'm going to continue shopping them proactively when I can but I don't think that anyone is necessarily offering uh us the package that I dream of. And just back to Mason Miller briefly with uh, the brilliant beginning to Mr. Paul Skeen's major league career. I know some of you have reminded me in the last week or so that we could have uh, gotten Skeen's for Miller and additional players. It wasn't straight up, but the one thing I will say is that Skeen's in this world that I am inhabiting is kind of the worst case scenario for what uh, Pittsburgh would think that he might become. 
He hasn't been in the rotation for the last couple years. Now he has moved into a closer role this year where he's been exceptional with a 0.39 ERA. But he did put up an 850 ERA in a similar number of games in the major leagues a year ago. And three and a half years into his MLB career, he's got a 476 ERA and a below average ERA plus and fit minus. So yeah, we could have traded Mason Miller and another piece or two and gotten skeins, but I don't think that that was going to uh, necessarily ensure that this Oakland squad is any more successful today than they have been. And it hasn't been that successful thus far. And while we're talking about Mason Miller, uh, he admittedly has not been as good this year as he was a year ago. Two and three with a 4.59 ERA. His Sierra a run and a half higher than it was a year ago. Hoping he will be more productive going forward. And both Paul West and NS1 CLRK have suggested that we uh, just be cautious with him to ensure that we can get him through the season and essentially um, get him into a strength and conditioning program next year. And I did have him already on the aggressive tiredness hook. I typically put every single pitcher on my team onto an aggressive tiredness hook. I just figure once they get to the point where there's a lot of stress on their arm, there's a higher chance of injury, and there is also a higher chance of ineffectiveness and in them just getting shelled. So I've already done that, but I did take their suggestion to put a pitch count in with um, him as well. And you can see we put him on a 90 pitch count now. And the reason I'm doing that is I think it was a good suggestion by both NS and Paul West to hopefully preserve his uh, health. But when I looked at the game log this year, He's only had two games where he's gone 90-plus pitches. And interestingly, they were two of his worst games. He hit 100 pitches for the only time this year in an outing when he went four and a third innings, allowed three earned runs while walking six, and then he went 98 pitches in a game when he went four and two-thirds innings allowed three hits, three earned runs, three walks. So he hasn't even made it to five innings in either of the two games that he's gone over 90 pitches. And it seems like we've just kind of pushed him, trying to get him to that five-inning mark on a day when he didn't necessarily have it. So I don't think we're going to lose too much with that 90-pitch limit can see it wouldn't have come into play in nine of the 11 games that he's pitched this year. And it may also, hopefully, help us ensure that he can stay healthy this year, pitch another 20-plus games for us as a starter, and, as I said, make it to the offseason well-primed to participate in a development lab program. And one last thing I do want to discuss, and this is going back to the suggestions from Bald Sherlock and Sean Gratt and to try to get a little more aggressive reshaping this roster, is what our center field situation looks like. And we know that uh, Estuary Ruiz went down. We replaced him with Luis Lara, who quickly went down. And then we replaced him with Christian Pache, who is about to come back from the I.L., so it's been a rough position for us with our first three starters of the year all on the IL before June 1st. But Ruiz is a guy that we may look to extract some value from. He's going to be out another three months, so he's basically going to miss until September roster expansion. And he's set to make about $7 million in next year, which is his last arbitration eligible year. And he's now 28 years old. He has led the AL in steals three consecutive years, but he's a below 250 hitter over his career, 
on base percentage of 326 is not exceptional for a leadoff guy. I don't even think it's technically good for a guy who's often leading off for us. And he's put up an 88 WRC+. Plus. Uh, certainly like his glove in center field. Love his speed. But he's getting expensive and he's a below average major league hitter. And when we kind of compare him with Luis Lara, I'm starting to think that when Lara comes back, he'll obviously be our starting center fielder for the rest of this year. But I kind of think Lara should be the guy next year as well. You look at the contact potential, it favors Lara a bit. Gap power, they're even. Home run power favors Lara a bit. I there even, and Lara is going to strike out less than Estuary Ruiz. So I think it's certainly fair to say that Lara is equal, and I would say a better offensive player than Ruiz. Certainly Ruiz has more speed, but Lara is not poor on the base paths, and he's a bit better bunter. And then when we get into their defensive ratings... Their range and error ratings are the same. And the outfield arm actually favors Luis Lara. So my thought is, um, we know what Ruiz is. He's a below average offensive player with a ton of speed who's good defensively. Lara, just as good if not better defensively just as good if not better with the bat and doesn't have the same type world-class speed but he's going to be a lot more cost effective and a lot younger so i've made the decision to try to move on from mr ruiz because not only would we benefit from hopefully getting something useful ish in return but we would also start right-sizing our payroll for next year and it would actually open up a little bit of money for us this year whether we decide to put that into player development with the little windfall that we'll have or whether we decide hey maybe we try to make some other trades that might improve this team so i have uh, submitted an offer to move on from mr ruiz and some other players and I think um, it'll kind of document if it comes back and we end up doing this deal that um, we're not likely to get incredible returns in this game with the settings that we're playing on. But there is potential if this deal goes through to at least get a young player who might be useful down the line, which is... Uh, all we can really hope for at this point. And with that, we'll finally start moving forward here in the month of June as we uh, start preparing for the draft. There's also a suggestion from Marilee Murphy, I believe, to maybe focus a bit more on college players in the draft and... Uh, I think that's a fair suggestion. We've definitely, the first uh, three drafts that we've done with this team, focused on high school players that we think have high ceilings, uh, trying to build this, in my vision, properly for the long term. But if we don't start winning some games relatively soon, we might not be around for the near to medium term, much less the long term. So certainly we'll pay attention, perhaps a little more attention to some college players when we are picking in about a month and a half. But I can't really recall over these first three seasons um, overwhelming incredible college players that I was incredibly psyched to um, pick up in these first three drafts. It's possible that there were some there and I'm uh, blocking that out in an effort to protect my fragile ego 
but I felt like most of the decisions I've been making, it's been several high school players that we've been talking about, doesn't mean that um, I've evaluated everyone correctly. And I certainly will try to follow Merrilee's suggestion and uh, look a little more closely at some of the college players this year because uh, it would help uh, us potentially jumpstart this thing a little bit more quickly if we're able to get some people that can help us in the next year or two rather than two or three or four years down the line, which is where a lot of our top prospects still are. And we've heard back from Kansas City on the trade that I had mentioned that I had uh, worked through and proposed offline, and we are just one player from making it work. Uh, they're looking for some of the better players in our organization or some of the better prospects in our organization. But Nico Horner, who we signed to a minor league free agent deal and is playing very well for us in AAA, would also get the deal done. Um, I think he would probably would be the person that I'll include to get this done. Uh, another guy who is a good fielder, but not much of a hitter. And uh, we've got plenty of them right now, most of whom are younger than Nico. So we'll be trading away Ruiz, and again, um, he's not going to play for us this year, so it actually will help us free up a little bit of cash this year, and then we also won't have to deal with the arbitration next year. We also have to include Jace Barofin, uh, the Rule 5 pick, familiar name for those of you who watched our Buffalo Wings expansion series in OOTP 24, and he's been rough for us, hitting a buck 71 as our starting right fielder against right handed pitching. So he's still at 25 years old, has a little bit of value, but we've got to move on from him, at least in the near term in the lineup. And since he's a Rule 5 guy, we can't send him down to AAA. So we might as well get what value we can from him. And then also Brady Singer, another guy who we signed slightly before the end, the beginning of the season. Um, he's been really good in AAA, 5-3 and three with a 2.21 ERA. But certainly not part of our long-term plans. A kind of fifth starter, middle reliever type. So we can trade, most notably, Ruiz and Barofin to the Royals. We'll get the minor league pitcher Dylan Jordan in return. Um, he's, I think, at almost 22 years old, almost certainly a reliever. And he's never made it out of rookie ball. Now, granted, he hasn't allowed an earned run in 11 innings pitched in rookie ball this year. So we probably would promote him to single A, but he only throws in the low 90s. Um, but we think his stuff could still be interesting. Movement and control, only average-ish. Potentially going to give up a lot of home runs, but he's not a completely useless arm as a potential right-handed reliever. But more importantly, they will include second baseman Alexis Furman, who looks like he could have pretty good power. Um, now his contact and his eye are close to average, the gap power potentially a little better than average, but the speed is below average, so probably still not going to generate a lot of extra base hits. He's really a second baseman who might hit a fair amount of home runs. And there's some value in that. He's not even 18 years old. Um, so he would be playing in rookie ball for us again. It's probably a coin flip as to whether he develops into a useful major league hitter. But we only have average scouting accuracy on him. The OSA views him similarly to how our scout views him, though. Doesn't bring much to the table defensively at all. Really even wouldn't want to play him in left field. 
with that 40 range and that 30 arm. So he's really a first base slash DH prospect to me, even though he's listed as a second baseman. But because he does potentially have that really good home run pop, I think it's worth getting something for Ruiz in terms of a mid-level relief prospect and probably a slightly better than mid-level first base prospect. We'll save some money by moving on from Ruiz. We'll open up a spot on the roster for someone who can hopefully hit better than a buck 71 by trading away Barofin. Singer and Horner aren't big parts of our plan. And moving on from Ruiz will let us um, try to make uh, Mr. Lara our longtime center fielder. And the final piece of this, and we are going to go ahead and uh, include Nico Horner and go ahead and make that trade which did open up some cash for us, which should be helpful. But the other reason that um, I've been thinking about doing this and if I could uh, use my brain properly, I would get to where I want to go much more quickly. But right now, Mr. Lara is not set to make a ton of money in arbitration. So what we've also done is um, try to make one of our offers to give a young player a fair amount of financial security by guaranteeing their contract for several seasons, but also try to get them signed at a more reasonable amount before they are really an established player. And... Lara right now is certainly not an established player, having hit 200 in his first 75 major league at-bats with an 81 WRC+. Plus. But as we talked about, I think he can be just as good, if not better than Ruiz going forward. He'll be cheaper, and he'll also allow us to bring a couple of mid-range prospects into our organization by moving on from Estuary Ruiz. So... Ruiz is now an ex-Oakland A, and hopefully Mr. Lara will be healthy and ready to take center field over full-time in just about a week. And since I have moved forward a day, I can just kind of show you the type of prospect packages that we could be getting for Santander. Uh, if we don't allow them to include other players on our team, you can see nobody offers us anything at all for him as far as prospects. And even when we do allow them to include some other players, there's not necessarily too much on that this list, at least in yesterday game time when I looked at it, that was particularly exciting. And you can see um, we also have to give up some of the better young players in our system, a Lawrence Butler a Max Muncy, etc., to uh, make any of these deals happen. So, I'm trying to think who was the most interesting player that was offered to us. And I mean, you can see here, you know, Santander and Lawrence Butler for a 23 year old catcher who is competent defensively and struggles to hit in A ball and high A ball at the age of 23. It's just uh, not that exciting. It's pretty slim pickings. I mean, Leonardo Bernal is a better catching prospect who's at least above average defensively and looks like he can be a borderline non-embarrassing major league bat but he's got some negative personality traits and again we got to give up butler in addition to santander to get him landon schaefer third baseman 
average bat with a probably below average glove for a third baseman or more accurately a below average arm for a third baseman the glove is probably average-ish but not all that exciting and again in addition to Santander we've got to give up uh, Max Muncy who although he has certainly struggled this past year we think his bat can probably be pretty similar to Schaefer's and he's a better defensive player so I'm going to keep taking the advice that some of you have given and, and we're going to continue looking for and shopping the older players on our team and searching the trade market far and wide to see if there's anything we can do even if it ends up being similar to what we did with Ruiz to try to uh, take as many shots as possible with younger players but uh, people are not knocking down our door to get a lot of these uh, juicy superstars that have contributed to this 23 and 31 record. And with the fact that we traded away Barofin, uh, brought Dominic Canzone back up from AAA, where he had only been a part-time player for us, uh, but you can see he did go two for five with the Ribby in his first major league action this year. Uh, we can only hope that he'll keep performing at that level. And then uh, Drake Baldwin is back from the IL, where he has uh, spent close to two months at this point. Uh, not even going to put him on a rehab assignment. Um, don't think he could do much worse than the performance we've gotten from Will Banfield and the recently demoted Joey Bart. Um, who we did try to shop. Uh, there was literally no one interested in giving us anything for Bart. Thought we might be able to extract a little bit of value from him, but uh, unfortunately, that is not the case. And we've still been struggling during this early stages of June, or these early stages of June, uh, 24 and 36 records, so our winning percentage is right at 400, still in last place, even though we did just win our last game yesterday against Texas. Brian Buelvis, the outfielder, injured himself attempting to fix his car, going to be out a couple weeks, no huge loss. He has not been very productive for us offensively this year, playing primarily against left-handed pitching. Luis Lara did ink that deal that I mentioned. Um, so this could end up working out really well for us. As we talked about, I think he's as good a player as Ruiz potentially. And on the margin, I think he could be a little bit better with the better bat, slightly better arm in the field. And he wasn't looking for a ton of money. So uh, you can see we've got him locked up through his minimum salary years, his early arbitration years, the end of arbitration, and even out into potential free agency. Um, with his glove, with his decent speed, with the fact that he's a switch hitter, worst case scenario, he's a useful fourth or fifth outfielder for us. And my hope is that maybe he can be a cost-effective center fielder for us who maybe puts up a OPS plus of around 90 if we're lucky in the majors steals a few bases and puts up you know two and a half to maybe three and a half war seasons at his peak and if he's able to do that for several years for us uh, the contract I think will work out very well And as we talked about in our last episode, we knew the beginning of June was going to potentially be very rough for us. Uh, we've gone a combined 2-5 and five against our divisional rivals in Texas and the Angels. Unfortunately, we are 0-7 combined against the Orioles. We knew that was going to be rough. Um, we do have a lot of games coming up this second half of the month against Toronto don't know if they're still worse than us, given that at this point we have lost five in a row and we have lost 10 of 11 and we're 2 and 10 in the month. So it's possible we're the worst team in baseball now. No, we're still actually better than Toronto. 
and we're tied with the Nationals. So we are not good, but the hope is that maybe the second half of the month of June we can uh, be somewhat more competitive because uh, avoiding seven more games against the Orioles, it's hard to imagine that uh, that's not going to make the schedule easier. And unfortunately, we've lost three more in a row against Seattle, pushing our losing streak to eight games. Really need to hope that this homestand with Toronto allows us to turn things around because uh, right now we are more than halfway through the month of June and we only have two wins in the entire month. And the good news is uh, it took 10 innings, but we did break the long losing streak against the Blue Jays in the first game of that four-game series. Uh, bad news is we just lost game number two. Uh, but the really positive development is that both Luis Lara and Cameron Cawley have started rehab assignments. Uh, Lara has missed uh, several weeks now, I think probably close to a month, if not a month plus with that strained oblique and Cameron Cawley recovering from, I believe it was a broken elbow. Broken bone in his elbow it has set him back for uh, just over a year at this point. And he did have the one setback. Um, but hopefully both of these guys will be up in the majors within the next few days. And, uh, Maybe they'll give us a little bit of a spark to this lineup. I certainly don't think they can perform worse, worse than most of the uh, players who have been out there thus far this season. And Brayan Buelvas has now recovered from that injury suffered while trying to repair his car. So we've got a 25-year-old, a 22-year-old, and a 24-year-old who are all likely to come back to the roster soon. So that will be our impetus for us to uh, search the trade market a little bit more and see if maybe there's something we can pull together. And with Buelvas and Lara on the way back, uh, we're not going to have room for Christian Pache for the long term, and he's out of options, so we can't sneak him down into AAA. So we're going to pick up Eddie Leonard for him, uh, another guy who doesn't have options. But Leonard, at the very least, looks like he is a, dare I say, good major league hitter against left-handed pitching. And he can play third base. He can play a lot of positions in the infield, as I mentioned in our last episode Max Muncy has gotten his major league career off to a rough start, hitting a buck 76 and 51 at bats, and he's not playing every day for us. So we'll send Muncy down to Triple A so he can get regular action, plug Eddie's Leonard into the lineup against left handed pitching, which will hopefully help us slightly on the margins, and also uh, move on from Pache to open up. Uh, one of the roster spots that we'll eventually need for Buelvis and Lara. And I just had a problem with my computer, so uh, it's possible the episode will be ending right now. If things go well, though, I'll just continue on. And just to kind of show the trade situation where... Uh, Shopping Josh Bores, the reliever, just to see if we can get anything in terms of prospects. And pretty much every deal we get, we also have to either have to throw in a closer Ian Hamilton or setup man Gabe Spire along with Spores. And you can see we're getting back non-prospects in their mid-20s that um, don't really look like major league players. Um, so there's just not a ton of interest in the guys that we have to trade. And I guess that's not shocking for 30-year-old plus relievers. But certainly if uh, we were trying to pick up these players in the trade market, they'd certainly cost us a lot more. And the second half of June ended up going 
better than the first half, but again, that's not saying incredibly much. Uh, ended up losing three out of four in that first series against the Blue Jays. We did take two out of three in Boston, then lost two out of three in Toronto before taking two out of three against the Yankees before the end of the month. But uh, we thought Toronto would be easier than the Orioles, and I guess they were, but after going 0-7 against Baltimore, we were certainly hoping for better than 2-5 against Toronto. As we sit here right at the midway point, a 30-51 and record. You may remember from the previous episode that our expectations were to be a 61-101 and team, so we're just about perfectly on pace for those very low expectations. And at 30-51, and we are... Officially the worst team in baseball, uh, battling with the likes of the Padres, the Nationals, the Royals for the worst record in the sport. As we sit here at the midway point of the season, we are one game worse than Pythagorean expectations. Had that brutal 8-20 record in June rank 13th in the league in runs scored, and we've dipped to 14th in runs allowed. Uh, mentioned at the beginning of the episode that uh, the pitching was disappointing, uh, but now it's gone from being at least the strength of our team to just as bad, if not worse, than the offense. Rank 15th in starters ERA and 11th in bullpen ERA. So the uh, Pitching has gone bad very quickly. Sean Manaya, 2 in 10. Last year's All Star, JP Sears, 3 in 10. And Miller, Schmidt, and Spence have been mediocre at best. And with July being a new month, uh, we did win the first game of July to end up taking 3 out of 4 in the Bronx against the Yankees. Mid-season review of goals with owner John Fisher, not surprisingly pretty rough, uh, disappointed in the team's performance, not happy with the lack of home runs, not happy that we haven't acquired a top player, very disappointed in our attendance, not pleased with fan interest, disappointed with what we've done in international amateur free agency, um, although those players haven't paid off at the major league level yet, which is what I think he cares about. I do disagree. I think we've brought in some pretty interesting players over the last three years. It says we've done a good job working on our farm system. Uh, it's an impressive collection of youngsters, so that's positive. Shockingly, he says he's been good with our progress towards the goals he's laid out for us, and similarly with our handling of the team's on-field and front office management. So, uh, a lot of negative feedback, but overall it seems like he still may be uh, somewhat patient with us as we try to hopefully turn this franchise around. And July after that opening day win against the Yankees has been another rough month for us. Lost two out of three against home against the White Sox. Swept at home against Seattle. We have taken the first two games of a three-game series against San Francisco before we head on the road to Seattle and the city by the bay before the all-star break. So it has still been rough. 34 and 56 is the worst record in baseball. Well on pace to have the worst record of our four years in charge of the Oakland A's and uh, we're flirting certainly with a 100 loss season, which would not be pleasant in any way. And in our next episode, and quite honestly, probably between this episode and our next episode, we are going to go do a very deep dive into see any type of value we can extract from the older players in our organization not necessarily expecting that there's going to be much there that's going to magically materialize but we will hope for the best but right now it's on to the first year player draft and we're going to be picking 14th which is the latest we've ever picked in our 
four previous drafts, or I guess technically our three previous drafts, plus this one in Oakland. Presumably we're going to be picking much higher next season unless we get very unlucky in the draft lottery. But right now the goal is to see what we can pick up at number 14 overall. So we're going to go ahead, get the draft underway, and take a look at the prospects who are still available for us with the 18th pick. And then uh, as we often do in the draft, we'll finish up the episode before our first pick. And if there are thoughts from you on which direction we should go, would love to hear them. It looks like a very deep draft this year, at least according to our scout. You can see a lot of five-star and four-and-a-half-star hitting prospects available. Pitching-wise, not quite as deep at the top, top end of the market. But we'll take a look at a few of the top prospects. Pitching-wise, Amari Dixie, 18-year-old high schooler. Extreme crown ball tendencies. I guess the question is just, is he really going to have a three-pitch arsenal that would enable him to be a starter? Or is he more going to be a potentially high-end right-handed reliever with a lot of stamina? Andres Rojas, 20-year-old out of the University of Connecticut, Avery Point. I'm guessing that says junior college perhaps next to it. Yes, junior college. Uh, he's not far off major league quality at this point. So this would certainly be the type of uh, college ready player that Marilee Murphy was suggesting maybe we should spend a little more time going after. But with only a two pitch arsenal is likely to only be a reliever. But one of those pitches is a knuckleball, so if there's any pitcher in the game that can be successful as a starter with just two pitches, it's probably a knuckleballer, but I think the stamina is also a limiting factor, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, got a knuckle and a circle change, and still somehow throws in the mid-90s. Uh, kind of an interesting combination here by... Mr. Rojas. Luis Romero. Don't love some of those personality traits. Looking for a lot more than slot. Does potentially have a six-pitch arsenal, which is pretty interesting. Uh, stuff, movement, and control all look like they could be well above average. It's really just a matter of do I want to take the risk on a high schooler with a low work ethic who's looking for a ton of money and also has the interesting nickname death blow and chris craig another high school pitcher uh, stuff looks potentially excellent movement and control average-ish but a potential five pitch arsenal three to five pitches most likely so interesting a couple of the pitching prospects don't necessarily see ourselves going after any of them. We'll look at another college player here in Bobby Holloway out of App State. Not too far off major league quality. And Holloway looks like he could potentially be a respectable fourth or fifth starter type as a left-handed pitcher. So I'm hoping the position players will be a bit more interesting, at least in terms of some higher ceilings. And we'll take a quick look at all of the four and a half star or higher rated players. I'll spend time offline investigating everybody. Uh, Kevin Wilkerson, shortstop. Another junior college player out of Laredo Community College. Poor competition level, but... Uh, According to our scout, a pretty interesting infielder. Solid defensively, potentially solid bat, not a lot of speed and doesn't know how to bunt. Do like the adaptability and the work ethic. Jonathan Todd, 18-year-old shortstop, 
really good personality, high leadership, work ethic, and intelligence, competent defensively, probably a third baseman defensively, and potentially enough bat to be interesting at third base with 70 contact and 60 power if it all works out. Looking for a pretty good chunk of change for the 18th pick in the draft, but not a bad prospect. Second baseman Kevin Metters, 17-year-old, like the high work ethic, really like the well-balanced bat, don't love the fragility, don't love the defense, but not the worst prospect in the world. And Zach Hickok is the last of the four-and-a-half-star prospects. Left-handed hitting right fielder, looks like he could have a pretty good bat, competent defensive corner outfielder, not much speed, looking for pretty solid money. And then we do have, looks like, eight five-star prospects, according to our scout. Woody Toopy out of Canada, or Woody Toop. Durable, potentially interesting power. Awful defensively, poor competition level. Earthquake Toop. Ian Tynan. Left fielder. Looking for big bucks around 9 million. Looks like a pretty interesting bat. Decent speed. Not the greatest corner outfielder in the world. Does have a high work ethic, low leadership. Still hoping one of these. I guess it was only uh, seven five-star guys, if I could count. Hoping one of these last five really jumps off the page at me. Second baseman, Kevin Stubblefield. Not much of a defensive player. Has a little speed. The bat potentially looks interesting. 60 power, 70 gap power, 70 home run power if completely developed. Ugh. Can play left field if you don't ever require him to throw the ball to somebody. Not the most impressive arm I've ever seen. David Ramirez, shortstop. This may play. High work ethic, respectable defensively, could definitely play a pretty solid third base, and a potentially interesting bat, above average in everything, and potentially well above average in contact, power, in eye, decent speed, not looking for a ton of money. He's also known as the Triple Machine, which given his average-ish gap power and average speed is probably coincidental. But I don't hate him. David Morales, second baseman. Uh, this is the kind of guy that I never draft, but I probably should. Contact, well above average. Gap power, excellent. Above average power, above average eye. Really good speed, good base runner. Only competent defensively. Could play left field if you needed to, but probably a first baseman slash DH. But that bat could be very interesting. Um, but the low work ethic... Bothers me a bit. Also looking for eight and a half million dollars. But can't rule him out. LQ Milescu. Thought we might have a dual citizen here, but he's American. Pretty interesting bat. Potentially incredible eye. 
like the durability plus contact and plus power if he completely develops definitely could play third base at a decent level looking only for slot someone to consider and last but not least Jesus Guevara first baseman potentially 70 contact and 70 power um, no speed not that good defensively but as I said potentially 70 contact and 70 power might be all you need to know committed to Pepperdine very high level very initial evaluation probably lean towards Ramirez but I need to spend a lot more time with this draft so um, if you've got thoughts on which direction we should go would love to hear them in the comments I'm also going to try to take these suggestions to heart and uh, continue doing a deep dive on anyone that we might be able to trade away certainly have looked at trading away Manaya off of his brutal year and um, the veteran pitchers Spire Spores Hamilton Aranyo have been looking at the markets for those guys but there's just not much out there I do kind of have to admit it 34 and 56 we're almost at the point where it doesn't matter what we can get just take anything but I do kind of feel like if we're getting a 30 year old with no options who's a worse player than the guy that we're trading away in return what's the point of just making a trade for trade's sake if it's going to weaken an already pretty poor team Position player-wise, um, we're not as old. We did just recently promote Cameron Cawley. And you can see he's uh, been in fuego for us. Hit 360 in AAA in his rehab assignment after missing about a year. And he's hitting 462 in his first 39 at-bats. So he's taken over as our everyday shortstop. We pivot, pivoted Rincon to second base and Ahmed is on the bench. I've been shopping Ahmed offline. Not a lot of interest in him, but Ahmed and Santander are at this point the only everyday players on the team who are older than 27 years old. So if we can extract any value from either of them, we'll try to. I just don't know how much there is. Santander has gone cold recently. Batting average has dipped to 255. WRC plus is dipped to 114, but I'm uh, still assuming that is uh, one of the stronger numbers on our team. Still leading the team in homers and ribbies. So it has, by any measure, been a pretty rough season in Oakland. But we've got the opportunity to add some talent for the future in the draft. And we'll see if maybe we can make another trade similar to what we did at the start of the episode with Estuary Ruiz and maybe at least bring back a player or two who at least have some chance of being productive for this organization in a few years. Whether we'll still be around with Oakland in a few years is certainly a question in and of itself, but we're going to operate as if we're going to keep this job and hope for the best. You can see if you're looking closely here that a couple of our big top prospects are only two top 50 prospects are having rough years in the DSL. Bertrand Albright in hitting just a buck 85, making his professional debut. And Juan Rodas, very disappointingly, after a uh, very successful trip to the development lab, is hitting just 
buck 44 in rookie ball this year after hitting 212 a year ago. He's drawn a decent number of walks, so that's something, but uh, a 258 slugging percentage is certainly not impressive. So we will tackle the draft and we will tackle the trade deadline in our next episode. Until then, thanks so much for watching and hope you have a great day.